Hello there, friends. Welcome back to the Rose Woman Pod. I'm Christine Marie Mason, your host. Every week we talk about something that is meant to create a little bit more freedom or spaciousness in your mind and body, maybe remove a taboo and move into more liberation. This week is no exception, because this week I'm talking about aging. And if you live in America, aging isn't like it is in Greece or India or Korea or Japan, where the aged are respected and even revered as sources of wisdom. It's different, because aging is biological. Yes, it's the length of your telomeres, the flexibility of your joints, the wrinkliness in your body, but it's also cultural and cultural attitudes against aging or the fear of death really impact all of our experiences. There are some pockets in the U.S., like in Native communities, for example, in Hawaii, where I live a lot of the time, elders are highly respected. The Hawaiian word kapuna means grandparent, ancestor, or honored elder. And in the Hawaiian culture, these kupuna are important links as the keepers of ancestral knowledge. But I find it really interesting that the word is the same word as the starting point or the source, and that we're really acknowledging where we came from. But while that's happening in some pockets, in most of the West, youth is really fetishized and human aging is looked at with a little bit of you, you know, distaste. And this is in part because a lot of the most sick, the the most elderly right in the last final one to five years are removed from the community and put into nursing homes, not really well integrated into the community. So we actually don't see a lot of the natural life of a human being in our culture. And I would say the other big piece is the economic component of aging. Uh, The There are people, of course, who have great retirement plans and who have saved and who've benefited from the increase in property values and hold a lot of wealth as they age. But the median household retirement savings is only $164,000. And to really survive the 20 to 25 years past the retirement age that you need, it should be 10 times that. So people who are in their mid-60s Really, many of them either have to really stop spending or keep working to survive. You know, I read one story about a a woman who retired and, you know, for $50 a day now she is sampling at the grocery store just to keep herself in pocket money because the sort of safety net is definitely not enough to do it. So you also have this piece where because of lack of resources, you're also not seeing a lot of elderly people participating equally in community activities and in commercial activities and stuff. You know, it used to be the retirement age was 65, and people didn't live that much longer uh, than that. And because people are living so much longer, uh, you can't retire at 65 anymore. If you're born after 1960, you have to sort of keep on trucking in until you're 67, because the system can't bear the ratio of working people to retired people. And how many retired people are we talking about? 80 million. 80 million people in the United States, or 20% of the population by 2040, will be retired. And that's up from 12% just 20 years ago. So you got fear of death, you've got fear of disability, you've got near poor to poor, and a lot of sort of ageism that is coming out of the way we look. I read somewhere that the elderly themselves are deeply ageist because they've internalized a lifetime of negative stereotypes about aging and that people reject their own beingness as they age and develop all kinds of coping mechanisms so they don't have to think about their own mortality. I mean, I do think there's been a tremendous amount of movement in the end of life world, um, EOL.org and other people, you know, let's talk about death over dinner, death over dinner movement out of Seattle. There have been a lot of positive changes in that. But we don't really talk about the space between, you know, the gradual process and all the taboos and all the fears of aging. I do like this quote, I'll give you a couple of smarty pants quotes now uh, from Deepak Chopra, who says, we are not victims of aging, sickness and death. These are part of scenery, not the seer, who is immune to any form of change. 
the seer is the spirit, the expression of eternal being. And so here again, you have this idea that you are witness consciousness, and now you get to look at your body and go, oh, interesting, what happens next? And uh, to go completely to the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, Goldie Hawn, actress Goldie Hawn, who's, you know, amazing in her older years, says you have to truly grasp that everybody ages, everybody dies, there's no turning back that clock. And so the question in life becomes, what are you going to do while you're here? And similarly, another actress, Frances McDormand, who just was nominated for an Oscar, uh, was just in this Oscar nominated film about an an older woman who is marginalized and living in her van and traveling around uh, doing seasonal work. She, uh, in, even in that film, was really embodying this idea of of how the latter part of life can become isolating and disconnected. Anyway, in her personal life, she writes, my position has always been that the way people age and the signs that we show of aging is nature's way of tattooing. It's natural scarification. And the life you lead gives you the symbols and the emblems of your life, the roadmap you followed. Now, things are changing in the way we understand aging, slowly but surely, with some of these philosophies uh, surfacing. Uh, In California, even, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which was founded by astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth person to walk on the moon, as his mission on the moon came to an end, he was returning back from the moon and his eyes became fixed on this blue sphere we call Earth. And he was enveloped by a profound sense of universal consciousness, of connectedness. He awoken to the unity of life. And he founded this thing called IONS, or the Institute of Noetic Sciences. They have launched a conscious aging program, which they call a unique opportunity for spiritual, emotional, and psychological growth in support of the last third of life, where you kind of dig in and think about how the and think about the gifts of aging, what is profoundly meaningful, what wisdom we've nurtured, and uh, how to celebrate, how to celebrate the phases of our journey and be participatory and leverage what we've learned to impact the world no matter what our age. And also to face the challenges together, the isolation, the loneliness, the possibility of physical decline, the possible loss of independence. So you see that going on at IONS and many other places are, have programs that are merging like that. And then you have things like Chip Conley, one of the original founders of Airbnb, has this modern elders academy that he started. Um, and that's, again, trying to look at what does it mean to be midlife and older now? And how do you use the wisdom that you've gathered and articulate and define and design the next act uh, and not let it just sort of happen to you. So because this topic has a lot of unexamined thoughts for us, I wanted to include it in the pod and to really give us an opportunity to think about where do the ideas we have about aging come from? And what kind of a life do we think we'll design for ourselves? How hard will you work to keep your exercise and your physicality going? How hard will you work to keep your looks and your hair? How will you work to keep your erections and your sexual function to stay fresh and keep abreast of technology, to keep learning, to keep neuroplastic, to find joy? What are you thinking about doing from 65 to 90, let's say? And what are you afraid of? Today, uh, my guest is Kathleen O'Brien, who is 72. She's a former Fortune 100 media broadcaster. She has a video production company, has taught media relations at graduate schools of business around the country, and she's now teaching aging philosophy through the University of Denver. Her new book is Reclaim Your Right to Grow Old, and she calls it One Part Manifesto, One Part Field Guide to Ditching Youth Obsession, and Embracing Aging with Style Class and Laughs. And I hope you enjoy this conversation and find it thought-provoking. Welcome to the Rose Woman Pod, and please welcome Kathleen O'Brien.
And it's so interesting because I'm looking at this beautiful woman. And my first instinct was to ask her, are you really the age that she says she is, which is 73 years old? And I'm look, and, I, and then I'm thinking, I believe I just directly played right into the thesis that we're going to talk about today, <laughs> which is not letting people grow old in whatever way is right for them. I'm so happy to welcome Katie O'Brien. We're going to talk about the right to grow old. Yes, we are, Christine. I would love to hear from you how this topic was born in you, sort of how did it arise and make you want to go to the extent of writing about it? Yeah, it started for me about 13 years ago, right before I turned 60. You know, I was thinking about growing older and I was asking myself, do I want to grow older? older the way society wants me to age. That is to to age gracefully, which is a term I'm not terribly fond of. In other words, to sort of tiptoe around aging and do it to please others and don't be a bother and don't get on in the way and just be a nice little old lady. And if you start looking old, run out and get wrinkle injections and facelifts because we don't really want to see you age. And all these other things that seem to me, Christine, like a big burden. And I thought, surely there must be a better way to age, even in our culture, which is very youth obsessed. So I decided I was going to do some research. I was a former television broadcaster and a broadcast journalist. And so I approached it as a journalist might. I went looking back into ancient civilizations to see the history of aging. How do people view it? a millennia ago. And I also started looking at other cultures to see, you know, are we missing something here? Well, it turns out we are. Ancient cultures always revered older people. It was built into their stages of life. It was expected that the older person would gain gain wisdom and perspective and maturity as he or she aged. And that was something to be valued. The older you got, the more valuable you actually became in that culture. And it's true of what I call enduring cultures today. These are cultures that have been around a long time, Eastern cultures, African Native American cultures, and they're all very similar in how they view older people. Uh, There's a reverence, almost a, a reverence or a deference toward people who are old. And I thought, this is the way I want to age. I want to be thought of as someone who has accomplished something. I've gone through life. I've given a lot to a lot of people. Now I would like to pass on my advice. I would like to be able to comfort younger people and tell them not to worry so much, which I do a lot of. And I would like to uh, be able to also enjoy this time that I have earned as an older person, this time that is mine to do with what I choose to do. So I decided that after looking at all of these various factors and our culture and the way it is today, I decided I was going to do a little uh, bucking up against uh, norms and uh, develop my own philosophy of aging, which I have taught at the University of Denver in their continuing education program. And and, uh, my philosophy has been, I think, pretty well received. I think it's a lovely statement to go back to the idea of reverence and respect for what one's learned. Although I would inquire in the West as to whether older is wiser. Like we all know people who are in older bodies who are still playing out the issues of their childhood (laughs) unexamined, you know, like they didn't learn the lessons that would make them older and wiser. They're just older. So there is a little bit of something that is inherent in the wisdom culture where you're already attuned to the relating with one another and sort of taking the lessons of how to live together better and learning them first before you can pass them on. So I do, do you think that there's something different about aging in the West that do you still get wise if you age in the West? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Gosh, you know what? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I really hope so. No, I love the word you use there unexamined or examined. And that is the key. One of the things I learned when I was reviewing all of this literature and, you know, going back into ancient civilizations is that there really is a belief that being older requires a lot of self-reflection. It does require examining your life in part because you have the time generally, I mean, most people are retired or semi-retired, or even if you're working, you're maybe not working at that same pace you kept up when you were in middle age or youth. So you have that time, but also you have the maturity to look at your life and say, okay, how did it go? What have I accomplished? What didn't I accomplish? How do I want to even use the term accomplish? Do I mean this in terms of material goods? And research shows that older people actually become less materialistic. More, most older people, not, not everyone. And, and I, our culture does fight that, Christine. I mean, when you said, can we mature in this culture? It's not easy. We put so much emphasis on youth, on productivity. And that's one of the things that's made this country so great. And one of the things that we're all very proud of, we are very productive. We're all busy and doing things. And that, you know, that's pretty nice. I mean, and it's nice when you're young and you're, you're on fire and <laughs> you just want to go out and accomplish everything. That's great. But the human life cycle doesn't end at middle age. It isn't just about the people who, who are destined to go out there and show the world what they can do. It also includes this time, these later years of self-reflection of this is the time when we can put those pieces together. I do believe that, that that's true, but I hear a lot of young people even saying that they've objectified themselves as a productivity object, and even they don't have time to feel or be or make the right decisions because they're running so hard economically. So I wonder, like, even when you say you have the right to enjoy at an older age, like so many people, I mean, I'm in my mid fifties, so people in my generation and above are, are not able to just sit back and enjoy. They expect to be working until they fall over. And so there's something about this culture, whether you're a very young person who's uh, committed to f- constant freelance jobs and running an Uber on top of your salary, or you're an older person who's on Medicare, like that, that the only time you have financial stability is when you're in this middle productive life. So, so what do you see happening with older people and economics in this country? Well, that is a tough question. I agree with you. And it's interesting. I interviewed a number of people for my book. And uh, one of the persons I talked to was a man who was in his mid 80s, who had a very successful career, but, but he had really sort of run out of money and was living on social security. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, it isn't easy. But what I do is I scale back and I just... Uh, pay for the things that are important to me. And he does get some help from his family, which is good. But the, but the point is a lot of it, I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, you should be able to live on social security. You've put all that time in, you should have those financial rewards. And it is very hard. I realize economically, but I still maintain that you don't necessarily have to be in the fray every day. You can still work, but you could work at a job that, you know, maybe pays you enough if you scale back a little bit and it pays you enough so that you can end up doing some of the things you want to do. And they don't have to be expensive things. I mean, maybe you've always wanted to paint, but you've never really had the time. Well, maybe you're still working, but you're not working full time. So, you know, you decide, oh, I'm going to dabble in this a little bit. This is a time in your life when you should not have the responsibilities you have when you're younger. I mean, your kids should not be coming to you and saying, pay for my wedding when they're making six uh, figure incomes. 
they should pay for their own weddings and let you as an older person live your life the way you want to live it. I know what I'm saying is anathema to a lot that goes on. No, it's all it's almost <laughs> blasphemous, the wedding comment. I don't know what you're talking about. I find that the response, even though the active responsibilities end, that I have colonized myself by by having played that role so long that even unlearning how to not like unlearning caretaking and opening myself up to this enjoyment you're talking about this free period that you're talking about um, is is interesting so we have we have spaciousness and we have self examination as two of the core principles for successful rethinking of of aging you said something in the intro around don't let us see you age ah yes Yes. Like tiptoeing around all the symptoms of aging. How do you show it? I mean, how do you let people see you age and be, do you, are, are you outright about it? Like, I think people like what you said with beauty, people are always fighting the beauty. They're pedaling super hard underneath, running so hard on the beauty front, things like cognitive decline or, you know, the reality of physical pain, hiding it from people, not really talking about what your direct experience is because you don't want them to think you're irrelevant or weak. So that seems to be something that we could learn to do differently. Do you, do you deal with that in your work? Yeah, absolutely. And we could do it differently. And those are excellent points that you brought up. I think the idea of, yeah, we're not supposed to bother other people with our aging. But the point is, we are really all in this together. This is a human life cycle that involves every single being on this planet. We all go through it. So we have to understand that when we begin to show more respect for older people, when we allow them to grow old in, in the way that each one of us needs to or is able to, we're also saying, you're gonna be able to do this too. Um, I, I, you know, I was your age, well, not quite 20 years ago, but um, it wasn't all that long ago. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm getting older. I'm in my mid fifties, you know, where am I going from here? What am I gonna look like? How am I going to feel? And what I really want to do with, with my grow old, be happy and reclaim your right to grow old philosophy is that I, I want to assuage some of those concerns. I want people to understand that aging is such a natural process, that nature has built in ways to ease it a little bit. There's a process called uh, called life review, and you may have heard of it. Oh, tell us about it. There are classes that older people in particular take uh, concerning life review. It is a term that was coined by the man who began the National Institute on Aging. His name is Robert Butler. He was a geriatrician. He also is the person who termed, uh, coined the term rather ageism. So he was sort of the father of modern gerontology. And what he discovered in his research is that as we grow older, and this seems to be, Christine, almost a, a universal kind of response, as we grow older and begin to reflect on our lives, we go through this process called life review, where we look back at our lives. We maybe grieve for some of the things that happened, some of the things we didn't do that we might wanted to have done. And then we also look with a certain amount of curiosity and satisfaction at the things we did do and made our lives happy. And what happens at the end of this, this kind of universal innate process, what happens at the end is that older folks come out feeling more sanguine about their lives ahead, about their old age, about death. So it's almost a way that nature has to prepare us for those later, those very old later years and death itself. So there are classes people can take. Um, gosh, I'm, I know that there are workshops that are available and they're called life review workshops where you write down all these things about, you know, what was it like when I was a kid, an adolescent, so forth. What did I learn? What would I have 
told my younger self if I could go back and do that. You're, you're seeing a whole a bunch of these that are designed to people who are just postmenopausal or just retiring, like the Institute of Noetic Sciences does ones like a guide to conscious aging. And I think uh, Chip Conley, one of the guys who started Airbnb, has now got something called MEA, a Modern Elder Academy. And he's and they're doing a similar process. Like, you know, you're you're not quite ready to quit, but it's also not the phase of your life where you've got little kids underfoot and you're trying to make a mortgage or whatever, but that you can reinvent it and do what you said in the beginning, which is craft a life that is more focused on service and enjoyment and you're being relevant, but in a new way. So I, I love that this is emer- like your work and it's an emerging theme. What do you think for you, just you, you've got this consciousness around it and you're going in into it with, with sort of an elegant awareness. What was hard for you anyway? Were there parts of it that were still difficult for you? You mean the aging process? It, yeah. Well, I had the same reaction that other people have had about it. I mean, even though I embrace my own philosophy, there are times when I look in the mirror and I say, you know, you're not, I see where this is going <laughs> and it's not going backward. And, you know, little things that crop up little, as they say, aches and pains, but but also the specter around you that, you know, you are going to die someday. So what disease are you going to get? What are you going to die of? And am I, do I have symptoms of things? I mean, these, this kind of thinking is more um, prevalent among people my age, where you begin to see friends who, I have friends who have uh, AFib, several. I have friends who've had a number of hip and joint, other joint replacements. I have friends who have kidney disease and other things that these are serious medical issues, some of them. You know, I'm well aware that I could experience these things myself. So, yeah, I mean, I think I am more aware and I'm like anybody else in this culture. I'm vulnerable to people saying, oh, try this and it will erase wrinkles. And I, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to step out of the culture when you're so much a part of it. But I think being older does allow you to take a more critical look at what is around you. I like to think that I do that. And I, I see so many older people who have such great wisdom and such wonderful, uh, such a wonderful way of looking at life. Um, And another thing that comes along with age that I think is, again, almost built in is resilience. And even if you're a person who says, well, you know, I don't think I'm very resilient. I can get down in a little hole. I can sit there and feel bad about myself. But most people who are older do have a way of looking at what they've been through and saying to themselves, you know, I've been through this before. I've been through difficult times just like these. They may have been different, but they were tough. And I have built up this store of resistance. Another wonderful thing that comes with aging, but also the realization of it. You may have resilience when you're younger, but you don't even particularly think about it because you don't really have that much time. I mean, time is such a friend to an older person in a way, because we can actually get into the moment. We can actually live moment to moment, day to day, a lot of us, and really, you know, ask the big questions, answer the big questions, uh, deal with difficulty, advise the younger among us how to deal with their own troubles, to be able to look objectively at life a little more rather than being in the maelstrom of it. And it, and it, it makes a difference. Yeah. There seems to be a distancing uh, for with each passing year of being able to step outside and look at what's happening without being identified with what's happening. And I can remember being in my twenties or thirties, like everything that happened was so intense. I was so in the (laughs) middle of it. And I'm like, wow, she had a lot of unnecessary drama, that one, you know, let's go back to the natural changes that occur. Uh, Can you speak a little bit, because our audience is also pretty interested in relationship and sexuality. Can you speak to what you've noticed among your cohort in that area? 
how do relationships change? How does sexual and sensual desires and need change? What are things that you've learned there? Yeah, relationships, I think among my friends, many of their, certainly their friendships have become stronger. Their romantic relationships have become, whether it's a partner or a husband or wife or whatever, uh, those relationships have become cemented in ways that maybe they wouldn't have when we were younger, in part because I think we're just more settled about who we are and what we want. And I also think older people are very good at compromise Mm. because, you know, you've been through so much, you know, a lot of us have had previous marriages and we see, well, maybe I didn't make the, the best choice, but also maybe I wasn't as willing to see that my partner needed to expand his or her self. Maybe I didn't give them enough leeway. Maybe I just didn't have the ability to make compromises because I was so self-focused. So I think when you're older, you are able to to make these relationships work uh, better in a lot of ways. Of course, I do know people who've just said, I've had enough. You know, I've been with this person for 40 years and I'm done. And I think that's okay too. I think it's okay because these are the years where we really have to, we have to say to ourselves, okay, what is it you really want? Because time is indeed limited. And I think that is a reality that sets in. It certainly set in for me. I would say when I turned 70, it was like, okay, 70 isn't an ingenue. I don't care how you look at it. 70 is an older person. Knowing that time is limited, I think, you know, you you say, I, I want to get the most out of this. I have talked in the past, not on the podcast, but I have talked in the past about having an NDE where I, you know, was out there in the liminal space for quite a long time and how amazing and beautiful it was. And that everything about both the expectation that I would be given more time was gone after that day. And also the fear of dying was gone after that day. And so this thing that happened to you at 70, where it's like, what are you here to do? Enjoy your life, make your choices and do it with not like a a sense of like, you're going to cram it all in before the scary thing happens, but because you know the life in a body is like a period of play. Yes. And make the most out of it. So the things you're saying, although they apply to people who are older, I feel like could how to be in relationship with compromise and how to say what you need in relationship, all the stuff we just left off on, like that is equally valid if you're 30 or 40, do that now. Like the way you get to a relationship where after 40 years, someone says, I've had it, I'm done, is you build up tiny little resentments every year for 40 years until there's no way of unweaving it. I agree. What about sexuality? What do you notice about the women in your age group? What I've noticed about, we all have similar feelings about it. Uh, Personally, I still have a lot of interest in sexuality myself and in my marriage. But I've noticed that there are some physical changes that happen, particularly to women. Men, we're always hearing about ED, you know, and uh, well, if you just take this or whatever, you're going to be okay. And and when I see those ads, Christine, I think to myself, what about his partner? Right. You know, if, if he's in a straight relationship, if he's in a relationship with a woman, then she's going to have to feel good about it too. And what I have found among uh, the women who are my age is that it's not always a comfortable thing. (laughs) And there are a lot of reasons for it. Uh, Part of it is um, lack of hormones. So everything sort of dries up, but it isn't just that. It's also changes that happen in your body, uh, physiological changes. Uh, women who have had, uh, for instance, um, hysterectomies and the way organs sort of reconfigure themselves internally and settle in sometimes makes sex uncomfortable. So there are those realities. We have to, I have to be honest about it. Those realities do exist. 
I will say for most of the women I know, they still very much have a sex drive, but they look for alternative ways to express it. It isn't always intercourse um, because intercourse often often demands uh, sort of a um, a little pharmacy at your bedside table <laughs> for various things to kind of lubricate and and to just to mitigate certain things and you know and it. Um, it does take some spontaneity out of it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but I think <laughs> let's get everything out and ready to go. Um, but I, I do think that the feelings are still there. Uh, orgasms are still there. All of it is still there. But we do have to work around some of the physical stuff. And I think that's just being realistic. It's just the way it is. Yeah, and that's, and you know what, that can be part of foreplay also. Yes. But this idea that the, the skin hunger or the desire to be touched or the desire to exchange intimacy, that doesn't end. We, I just finished a survey with uh, 400 women talking about uh, their sexuality and their sensuality. And, you know, most of the women in their seventies and eighties who responded said they longed for sexuality. Most of the, if they, a lot of them had lost their partner and this, and they said, if they could find someone who was age appropriate for them, they would love to be in a sexual relationship again. So there's, there was a lot of grief around having lost it, not so much a desire to be done with it. It was the opposite. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's true. And also, I know when I was younger, I remember thinking, well, if when I look older, is anyone going to find me attractive? Or when I'm with an older man, what's that going to be like? Well, if you're with someone who is more or less your age, uh, you, what you find attractive as you age uh, changes. You know, I, I look, you know, my, I will say my husband works out all the time, so he looks pretty good. But the point is, he's five months younger than I. So we're both in our 70s. But he's he looks great to me and he looked great to me. 20 years ago, and we met in fourth grade. So he looked great to me when he was nine. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's the soul love, ladies and gentlemen. It it's is the soul. It's the energy. It's Absolutely. The of recognition. Thank you. Yeah. And his intelligence and sense of humor and all of that. Uh, the fact that he's in, in great shape for his age is great, but that's not really what attracts me to him. And I remember one person who was a, a neuropsychologist who was an expert in sexuality and worked at the, um, oh, it's going right out of my head. And I went to school there, Indiana University. I can't think of it. Anyway, he worked there. And he said that the most important sex organ in the human body is the brain. Yeah, for sure. So yes, we all want to be touched and held and sexually stimulated into our later years. So don't worry, young people, you're still going to have <laughs> that feeling. <laughs> and you're, you're still going to probably be able to satisfy it one way or the other. So that's the good news. This is really beautiful because one of the things that I've been on lately as a rant is that you don't know what's coming. Like if you talk to a woman who's in her thirties, she doesn't know perimenopause. If you talk to a woman in perimenopause, she doesn't know from her mother what menopause was like. It's like a secret chain of non-communication. And same with this. It's like, I don't, women in their seventies and are generally not doing what you're doing, going out and educating people that this is what life is like out here. Thank you very much. Don't be afraid. In fact, embrace it, do it differently. That the lack of information is the worst part. It's like looking to a black hole of the future. And so it's really vital to hear that there is logical, physical changes, but also some normalization and like, it can be beautiful. One thing in the women's literature, there are almost no studies in the medical literature on sexuality in women other than after menopause, which means they've lumped 52 to hundred into one bucket. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't surprise and me. And I feel like there are definitely parse, uh, finer parsing stages that we could look at. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about how your work is being received and how you're rolling it out and how you're offering it in the world. Yeah. How it's being received. It's being received pretty well. You know, when I was teaching those classes uh, through the University of Denver, um, I got a lot of really, really good response from my book, even though it's been released recently, I've gotten emails from people 
really all over the country who have said, I had a couple of people said, this is the best thing I've ever read about aging, because I think people are hungry for ways to age in a, I don't know, in a way that's natural, that makes people feel good, where they don't have to work so hard trying to be young all the time. I will say, though, there there has been some pushback. It's interesting. I wrote this article and I I just found out today from my publicist who said, um, well, they they want you to, it, it's a, a it, somewhere in the heartland, I won't say where, but um, they said they really like your writing and all of that, but, but your message, they're a little concerned about your message because some of their audience has had plastic surgery. We don't want them to feel bad about it. And of course, I didn't write that, that, that it was anything wrong with it. I just offered alternatives like you don't have to do that. And we don't want young people to feel bad that, that they're not good role models for older people. Well, they're not. <laughs> They're not good role models. For, they're good role models for younger people. And when I talked about we need new role models, we do. I mean, I can't be 17 again. When I open Vogue magazine and see a 17-year-old in an outfit that she could hardly afford, um, you know, that's not what I want to look like. So then my publicist said, well, what should we do? And, and my reaction was, well, I think uh, I spent a lot of time writing the, this article. I, I spent a lot of time in my writing because I think it's so important to, to write well. Um, I said, well, maybe we should shop it somewhere else. I mean, why should I, <laughs> you know, kind of go back on what I'm trying to get across and what I'm saying because I'm getting some pushback? I guess my feeling is maybe those people need to hear this message, but if you as the editor of this publication don't want them to hear it, well, that's your call. It's your magazine. So I feel like even, even those objections are so like, you know, if you want to have plastic surgery, have it. Yes. Because don't have it because you think there's something wrong with you that you have to fix. Have it because there's something you, you know, it's an expression of some sort, but like not because you're getting older and you don't have a place in society and you've got to run from that. And the same thing with where it is your role model. I, I was introduced to the concept of dominance hierarchy versus competence hierarchy. And I think there's a very big confusion in that. Like that, you know, you, you have people who you naturally uh, revere or bow down to who have competence that's developed from experience. They're not lording it over you like a dominant patriarchal figure where, you, where you're not sovereign. You're choosing to respect that competence. And the confusion around competence and dominance in the culture make people want to say like, nobody's the boss of me. I'm my own expert, you know, and that that's like not quite uh, an inner maturity. Cause if you have an inner knowing, you know, where there, you, you have an awareness of where your gaps in knowledge are. Yes. Well, I agree with you. Shop it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I did want to be validated. Stand your ground. I feel validated. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to. So where can people find you? And, and if they want, I'd love for you guys read the book. And also I'd love to hear what everybody else has to say. Like you're, you're, uh, you're going there. Did you ever go back and look at pictures of your grandmother as a child? And then as a teenager, and then as a, you know, and you, and you go all the way down and then boom, she's gone. And then your mother or your father, and then there you are, you know, you're going there, people. <laughs> so get used to it, celebrate it, find a way to just make it another joyful experience of life in a body. So tell us where we can find you and all your wonderful work. Well, you can go to my website anytime you'd like to do that. Uh, grow old, be happy. Dot com, And I write blogs and I also post podcasts uh, that I've been on and links to articles I've written and also where you can buy the book. You can click right there at Grow Old, Be Happy, or you can go to Amazon, look under my name, Kathleen O'Brien, or Reclaim Your Right to Grow Old. Uh, you can go to Barnes & Noble or you can go directly to my publisher, at Outskirts Press and order the book there. Instagram for all those people, grow old, be happy. Instagram, Pinterest, <laughs> Twitter, 
uh, Facebook. I'm on all of those. Just tell me yeah. you're not on TikTok. No, I'm kidding. But oh, I'm not on TikTok. Oh, oh no. my gosh, See? I don't even totally get it. I have to admit that I don't. I mean, I can do that. <laughs> For those of you who are just on audio, we're just dancing in the camera now. We're doing the TikTok dances. Yeah, we are. And we're and we're doing pretty well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody, let's do that. Grow old, be happy. Be where you are now. Be happy. It's it's the one life you've got as far as we know. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you, Christine. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And before I close, I wanted to point out a few things from The Spirituality of Aging by Drs. Weber and Orsborn. They do a pretty good job of helping people ask important questions uh, around the age of 60. They talk about things like, what illusions does aging dispel? Like, does it change your concept of who you are as you get older? What changes your to your identity occur? They ask a question that is really profound. What qualities did you neglect in the first half of your life that you are now free to develop? That, you know, the, with longevity, we have all of this time to explore new ways of relating to the world, to let go of what doesn't serve us or things we haven't tried, and to really take this midlife time to take stock of that and make some decisions about what you want to explore. They ask what the right role of regret, shame, and guilt might be in order to come into full ownership of how you have lived thus far and uh, take take charge and responsibility and see how just that act might change your experience of life. And they also talk about the paradox of aging, writing in the best case scenarios as our external faculties diminish our internal resources, acceptance, gratitude, and faith advance. The quote they give us is, in the constant challenge to the status quo that aging asks of us, it's ironic that the letting go that is often at once the most unwanted and most natural part of growing old turns out to be the very means of our deliverance. So as we go into what in India might be called the forest years, where we withdraw from the mainstream a little bit as a definitive break with our regular life, or just withdraw into ourselves a little bit more on the daily, that we can be transformed. It, it doesn't mean, they say, it doesn't mean that we can't respond to the organic urges that well up in us to create or build or make a difference. I mean, look at Stuart Brand and what he's doing at, you know, in his 80s. It's amazing. Or, uh, you know, women who are painting until the day they die, you know, this is just, you can keep creating. But that our old dramas, our fascination with victimhood and self-importance finally lose their power over us. We neither need approval nor to judge. And I think that's a really exciting promise as we come into wisdom, not just into age. All right. I would love to know what you're asking yourself as you think about what getting older means. And how you feel about imagining it and what you're afraid of, if anything. And if, if it arises, like if something arises in you on age that you like, sh if, is there anything that you stuff down and, and try to run from? Because I want us all to be free around this topic too. And to embrace our lives from birth to 100 as all part of this beautiful, natural, blossoming architecture of the soul in a body. Okay, you know where to find me, Instagram, the.rose.woman, or at Rosebud Woman, my amazing company that helps people have better intimate experiences in that same time frame, their whole life long. And oh, by the way, if you like this episode, if it prompted some questions for you, some inquiries for you, please pause right now and text it to someone who might like it. All right, all love. <laughs>